Welcome to Staying Grounded in Antarctica, a briefing prepared by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration Institute for Telecommunication Sciences Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado, for the National Science Foundation U.S. Antarctic Program. I'm Frank Sanders, Senior Technical Fellow at the Boulder Laboratory. We'll begin with an introduction followed by a review of circuit basics. After that, we'll look at electrical power transmission and grounding in general and electrical power drop grounding in general. After that, Antarctic power sources and power drop grounding that are peculiar to Antarctic locations. We'll look at worksite grounding and the difference between neutral and ground in power circuits. After that, electronic box wiring, including safety grounding for such boxes. For electronic boxes, we'll also look at signal ground versus earth ground, and we'll look at ground loops and how to prevent them. We'll look at grounding in common for racks and boxes, such as to avoid floating grounds. We'll examine electrically connected gear when they're on a single UPS versus being on multiple UPSs and knowing how to decide which way to wire them. Finally, antenna grounding including static discharge and lightning arresting will be considered. And then we'll conclude with a brief summary of the entire talk. In the mainland U.S., electrical power circuits are taken for granted. In Antarctica, in contrast, electrical power systems such as at McMurdo, Black Island, and the Pole face special challenges. Among these challenges are special, read, difficult, grounding environments. This talk reviews critical knowledge for understanding grounding conditions and challenges at U.S. Antarctic program stations, both for power and for instrumentation electronics. Best practices are recommended as the talk progresses for researchers to understand and implement proper, safe grounding at Antarctic stations. Reviewing Circuit Basics Electricity does useful work only if it moves in a loop or circuit. Electrical charge moves from a higher potential energy to a lower potential energy via movement through a voltage differential. The amount of charge flowing past a point in a circuit per unit time, that's the current, multiplied by its potential energy drop, that's the voltage, produces the energy per unit time, the power, which is delivered for some combination of useful work and heat. A current that is doing work requires a return path to the source, which could be a battery, power plant, and so forth, through which the motivating voltage in the circuit is driving it. It's very important to understand that voltages are always differences. There is no absolute voltage reference. There is no absolute zero voltage point or value that exists on its own. Only voltage differences between points can exist. Voltage differences between given points can be, and often should be, zero for proper and safe circuit functionality. For linked electrical circuits, the need for a common voltage reference point between circuits is especially true. Usually, it's a requirement. That's what this talk is fundamentally about, getting linked electrical circuits to always see the same relative voltages. This happens via a shared, in common point called the grounding point. We begin at the power source. Commercial power is normally generated as alternating current, not direct current, with three independent phases 120 degrees apart, plus a reference line, the ground line. This so-called balanced load is run through power distribution lines at high voltage, producing lower transmission line losses than lower voltage. Four physical lines are required for this so-called three-phase transmission scheme. Phases A, B, and C, plus a ground. 
At customer locations, main distributed power is dropped off a pole or sometimes brought in from a buried line via a vault through a voltage power transformer. A pair of current carrying lines plus a ground wire will be brought into the site for a total of three physical wires. The drop lines have an RMS voltage difference of 220 volts between them and each line has a voltage of half that amount, 110 volts, relative to the third line, the ground line. Power at each site outlet can be either 110 volts or 220 volts, depending upon how these current carrying lines are wired into an individual outlet relative to the ground line. Ideally, the ground line from a transformer at the customer site should be connected to a buried plate or other large piece of well-earthed metal at the base of the transformer pole or just outside the vault box when or if conditions permit. It can be instructive to actually look at power drop locations and identify the ground wires that are brought down from the transformers to the buried plates in the ground. We pause for a few moments to consider the power sources at U.S. Antarctic Program stations at McMurdo, Black Island, and the Pole. Power sources at these stations include fossil fuel generators, wind turbines, and solar array systems. All of these power sources are grounded, as permitted by local conditions, at the sources and along the power transmission lines out to the customer drop locations, including base housing, experimental stations, and field sites. On this slide we see photographs of modern wind turbines at McMurdo, fossil fuel generators at Black Island and at the Pole, and a historic photo of McMurdo above ground power lines undergoing construction and maintenance. This slide shows some of the power conditions at Black Island, including a fossil fuel power generator, battery packs, and an aerial view depicting the site's crystalline, high resistivity, basaltic, rocky ground. This kind of ground does not make for easy grounding. Here we see a map of the McMurdo Station power grid on the left, and on the right, a photograph of one of the power station's newer grounding rods driven into a 20-foot hole near the edge of the water. Notice on the map a line labeled ground to sea running from the power plant into the sound at center left. At McMurdo, the power plant's master grounding point is connected to both a submerged caterpillar bulldozer at the bottom of the sound, hence the line that we saw earlier on the map, and also to a set of 20 foot long, 2 inch diameter sets of drill steel just inside the shoreline. Both these sets of grounding conductors include heavy gauge copper. At the McMurdo power plant, grounding is therefore from the plant to the sea and to the wetted shoreline. These connections are necessary because both at McMurdo and at Black Island, the native ground is extremely hard, crystalline, basaltic rock. Its typical resistivity is high at 1,000 ohms. For structures at Black Island and McMurdo, for example, wind turbines, Grounding is typically achieved via the structure's own steel foundation rods or pilings. As for grounds at local buildings and sites away from the power stations, to quote U.S. Antarctic Program personnel, it's nearly impossible to get a decent grounding connection into the crystalline frozen rocks at McMurdo and Black Island. The solution that's usually taken at the local sites is to bond equipment together so that all metal parts are held at the same potential locally at each site. The same approach is taken at the South Pole Research Station, where there is of course no solid ground at all, only ice. Moving from the power stations to power drop locations, at each given building or site, the local electrical circuits will have their own power ground as specified by NEC guidelines and installed by a qualified electrician. Building or site power grounds may be a buried metal plate, 
or a copper rod at least 10 feet long, with 8 feet of that length buried below ground and 2 feet above ground conventionally. Or the ground may be connected to a buried metal water pipe with at least 10 feet of the pipe buried in the ground. Given the local conditions already noted at U.S. Antarctic program stations, however, the grounding connections may be made to buildings' own frames, or to some combination of the above, local conditions permitting. Personnel at U.S. Antarctic stations are encouraged to consult with expert local electrical staff to thoroughly understand the precise grounding conditions that hold at each of their own local buildings and sites. We leave this part of the discussion by noting one last time that at Antarctic locations, the grounding options are typically reduced to bonding with building frames at local sites, and that this is due to the lack of good rock soil at McMurdo and Black Island and the lack of any soil whatsoever at the pole. This aerial photograph illustrates one more time the rocky, crystalline, basaltic conditions that we have at McMurdo and Black Island. Next, we examine power circuits inside buildings and work sites. The three wires that deliver power to such sites, two carrying current and one being the ground, enter the site via a main breaker box. Inside the main breaker box, a fourth wire, existing only inside the site, called neutral, is connected to ground at a metal tie point or tie plate. Within the site, three wires go to each outlet. One of these is hot, which supplies current. Another is neutral, which returns the current to complete the power circuit. And the third is the power ground for safety. Although the neutral is wired to ground on the so-called tie plate inside the main breaker box, neutral is never ever electrically ground. For each of the circuits inside the site, breakers or fuses should trip and cut off the circuit if a short circuit, which is a direct connection of hot to neutral, should occur. But we never rely on such devices to save lives. If all else fails, whether breakers or fuses work or not, ultimately the power ground is our safety. The power ground returns current to the plant in a wire instead of someone's body through the floor they're standing on in the event that a short circuit should occur. Neutral and ground circuitry deserve to be understood thoroughly. The neutral and ground circuits, wires, in a building or a site should be connected at only a single point in the site by a qualified electrician. This single point, as already noted, is ordinarily the neutral tie block in the main breaker box. Connecting neutral to ground at any other point in a building or site, creating multiple connection points, can put current into the safety ground wiring. For this reason, we never connect ground to neutral at an outlet or anywhere else. A qualified site electrician should always be contacted about outlet wiring, including especially multi-prong outlet adapters, adapters with grounding screws, and so forth. This notwithstanding the fact that such items are sold in hardware stores. They are not necessarily safe to use, should not necessarily be used in a circuit, and use of them, if at all, needs to be verified, again, with a qualified site electrician. Now we consider electric circuits inside electronic boxes or appliances and how they interact with the outlet wiring in a building or a site. With standard three-wire alternating current power outlets, current enters the equipment, which could be experiments, appliances, and so forth, on the hot wire. This inflowing current does work and generates some amount of waste heat in the boxes or appliances internal circuitry. Return current then goes back into the outlet via the neutral wire. The outlet's ground prong wire should ultimately connect to the box's ground and its possibly metal case. 
contact a qualified electrician for help if in any doubt about a power outlet's wiring or integrity. In the event that an AC power outlet's input, the hot wire, happens to connect directly to the output, the neutral, or to an electronic boxes or appliances metal case via a so-called short circuit, then the return current should flow into the AC power outlet's safety ground wire. Breakers in the buildings or site's power wiring or fuses occurring within a well-designed electronic box or appliance should also trip in the event of a short circuit, shutting down the short. But backup devices like fuses and breakers take a finite amount of time to trip. In the meantime, before they can trip or activate, or in the event that they do not activate at all, the AC power outlet's safety ground wire can save a person's life. If a safety ground is not properly connected and working, or if an AC power outlet is an old-style two-wire item with a box or appliance that is not itself double insulated, then the return current from a short circuit may complete its path to the floor or wherever via a person's body. This can injure or kill someone. At the buildings and sites where you're living and working, you need to understand your power circuits and outlets. Contact a qualified site electrician to check and service a site's power circuits and outlets if in any doubt about the safety or integrity of those outlets. We now move from grounding in power circuits to grounding inside instrumentation boxes such as are used for experiments and telemetry. These grounds are called signal grounds. Good or proper signal grounding inside electronic boxes should minimize electromagnetic, conductive, magnetic, which is inductive, and capacitive coupling that can generate noise and interfere with the circuitry's processing of signals or data. A proper signal ground provides a single, that's a common, voltage reference for all parts of the signal system's circuitry. Similarly to a safety ground, the signal ground will not carry current under normal or ordinary circumstances. There is, of course, an actual signal return path that will carry return current for the box's circuit completion. Redundant grounding between two or more boxes can cause a problem in which the connection of one of the box's signal wiring to the earth grounding can cause current to flow between that box and ground with another second box having a signal ground that's also connected to the earth ground. This condition is called a ground loop and is diagrammed on this slide. For example, a signal source in one box and a load in a second box can generate a current between the two boxes via their common earth ground and one or more conductors running between them. This double or duplicated ground path for the two boxes with a conductor between them acts like an inductive or loop antenna. This antenna converts microcurrents into microvoltages that can look like noise in box circuitry. Ground loops can be prevented by not allowing unwanted current path connections between signal grounds and power grounds in electronic boxes, as diagrammed on this slide. Problematic connections of multiple signal to chassis locations should be reduced to a single point or possibly no points at all. The chassis of multiple boxes can themselves be connected to eliminate differential voltages between the cases or between their respective equipment racks. But if no part of the signal grounding system contacts an earth ground, then there should be no ground loop opportunity. At some buildings or sites, Multiple power sources, such as overhead power lines and on-site generators running on diesel or gasoline, may be providing power to multiple racks of equipment. If this happens, 
The grounds between the racks may not be common. We may have a floating ground between the equipment racks and the boxes in those racks. This can cause problems with the operational functionality of the electronic equipment in those racks. If this condition is known or suspected, a qualified on-site electrician should be contacted and consulted to develop a proper, common ground across all racks and the box chassis in those racks. At a site or within an area at a site, a variety of electronic and electrical gear may be connected to the power source via an uninterruptible power supply or UPS. UPSs are used to carry equipment through transient power failures and extended power failures and are used to condition poor power into better power for better functionality of the electronic boxes at a site. UPSs can only sustain a certain amount of power for a certain amount of time and it may be tempting at a site where an UPS cannot carry all of the equipment for a sustained period of time to connect only some equipment to the UPS while leaving other non-essential equipment like possibly computer monitors unconnected to the UPS. This is not a recommended procedure. Tempting though it may be to put a power hog like a monitor onto a non-UPS power outlet while the rest of the system, such as a computer, is running on an UPS, splitting the power sources between UPS and non-UPS power can cause multiple grounding, which is to say floating ground, problems. If a single UPS at a site cannot sustain all electrically connected gear long enough in a sustained power failure to meet site needs, then an adequate, which is to say a larger, UPS should be acquired for that area or for the entire site. We now move from power circuit grounding and electronic box circuit grounding to grounding for antennas. Antennas present a special case for grounding. A particular problem is to protect antennas from atmospheric electrical discharges, including from static buildup and from lightning strikes. Static electrical discharges can be a particular problem in Antarctica, where dry air and high winds can combine to create high levels of static charge differentiation between the earth, the structure, and the surroundings of an antenna. When high concentrations of differentiated charge occur, for example, free electrons are building up in the earth at the base of an antenna and positive charge concentrations are occurring in the air above and around the antenna. These differential charge distributions can become so large that they exceed the static condition breakdown limit for atmospheric conduction. When that happens, an electrical discharge will occur. Static electric discharge and lightning strikes are catastrophic. They can damage and destroy equipment and they can injure personnel who are in their vicinity. A common misunderstanding about grounding systems for antennas is that such systems are intended to channel discharge energy into the ground near an antenna. In reality, protection systems for antennas are intended to prevent any strike from occurring in the first place. A well-built system to protect an antenna from static and lightning strikes will bleed charge between the earth and the sky to eliminate the differential charge distribution between the earth and the sky before any kind of catastrophic discharge or lightning strike occurs. In a protection system for static discharge or lightning strikes on an antenna, pieces of metal are arranged to bleed off charge between the earth and the ground before a strike can occur. These pieces of metal, typically called lightning rods, will have extremely sharp tips. The concept is that the sharper the tip, or the thinner the piece of wire that's being used in the protection system, the higher the charge density that will occur in the tips, 
and the more efficient the resulting charge bleed off will be into the air due to that high density right at the ends of the tips. With the bleed off path prepared and running, charge buildups are dissipated slowly before a catastrophic discharge voltage level is ever reached. This slide shows a schematic diagram for a lightning arresting system and a grounding system for an LNB or LNA feed on an antenna. Experienced on-site electricians, installers, and maintenance staff need to be consulted for the best information on properly grounding antenna structures and antenna feed circuits. The following few slides do provide some notes, however, on best practices. A typical practice for antenna grounding is to connect the radio signal coaxial cable ground, which is the outer shield of the coax cable, to a common ground with the antenna mast and structure. This is done via a grounding block, which is shown in more detail on the next slide. The grounding block taps the coax shield electrically over to the main building and power ground. The mast and antenna structure is connected to the same major ground via a heavy solid copper wire and grounding clamps. All of these components, grounding blocks, coaxial cables, heavy solid copper wire for grounding and grounding clamps, are commercially available and will be available via the on-site electricians, installers, and maintenance staff at your work location. As noted, the ground block is the key component that connects an antenna's electronic circuitry ground to the power ground. A ground block is basically a coaxial connector, male-to-male -male barrel, which contains an integral, metal, screw-type ground connector on one side. The ground block connects the coaxial cable's outer shield to a screw-down connection with a heavy-duty copper ground wire running from that point to the main power or building ground. In order to protect from moisture effects, ground blocks must be installed horizontally and they must use weatherproof coax connections. Additionally, water drip loops must be in place on both sides and they must go below the ground block, as shown in this slide. Usually, ground blocks are placed close to the ultimate building and power grounding points. Summarizing this presentation, proper grounding is crucially important for electrical power systems, electronic boxes, antennas, personnel safety, proper circuit performance, and damage prevention. As much as adequate grounding is taken for granted in the continental U.S., the U.S. Antarctic program stations present difficult environments and special challenges for both safety grounding and electronic circuit grounding. This presentation has covered the basics of grounding for electrical power transmission, safety grounds at work and living sites, electronic box grounding for prevention of interference effects in circuits due to ground loops, the need for single UPS plug-ins at sites, and antenna grounds. A best practice is to make every effort to understand grounding configurations, needs, and possible special conditions at your own U.S. Antarctic program sites. Some station situations may call for special care and attention in unique and challenging grounding environments. Always, if in any doubt about any grounding condition for power, electronic boxes, antennas, and especially for power system safety grounds, always consult with and obtain the services and support of qualified on-site electricians. Thank you very much.